21 through 23. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. This is our text for today. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Easter, what a wonderful time, right? Last Sunday, churches were packed, praises were sung. It was just fantastic. Everybody enjoyed it. And over the years, different traditions with regard to Easter have come forth. And maybe you've experienced some of these yourselves. I'm not sure what your church does with regard to Easter with all the added little things. But sometimes there's a sunrise service. Sometimes there's an Easter breakfast. Certainly an Easter egg hunt. And as you take a look in scrapbooks and you take a look around the congregation, new outfits come forth, Easter bonnets and the like. They're all over the place. And of course, there is the, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And it's great, isn't it? Now we're in the Easter season. And it's been quite a time, you know, through the whole season of Lent. That season seemed to go on and on and on. We we took the opportunity to reflect upon our sins, to reflect upon the passion of our Lord, all that he went through, and all that we have done. It's kind of a, a time when we kind of feel rotten because we know that our sins continue to come forth, and we know that Jesus had to die so that we might be saved. It was a long period of time, and all those extra services that we attended during the season of Lent as well. In Holy Week, wow, it really kind of came to a climax with it all, with Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and some congregations even have what they call an Easter vigil now. But all all that's over with. Now we bask in the glow of Easter, don't we? And we feel relieved. We feel now we can get back to normal and things are going to be great. Sins are forgiven and we can move forward in a nice positive way. Well, on that first Easter, it was a little bit different, though, wasn't it? Moving forward, don't know if the disciples felt like they were going to be moving forward at all. If anything, they were questioning everything that they had done in the past and wondering what was going to happen, what was going to take place. We see it in our gospel reading, as I mentioned, it's a gospel reading for the second Sunday of Easter. Every year, they were up there behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. If there was ever a time that the words of Jesus were more pertinent to them, could that they could identify with them more than anything else. It was when he appears to them behind locked doors. He says it twice. We hear it three times in our gospel reading for today. But on that first night, the, the, the evening of the day that he rose from the dead, he comes to them and he says, Peace be with you. And we are reminded that Jesus was going to give a different kind of peace. And we'll mention this a little bit later on in the sermon as well. But on the night he was betrayed in John chapter 14, Jesus says to his disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, but as I give. Peace be with you. If there was ever a group of people that needed to hear those words from Jesus, it was these disciples in that upper room behind locked doors who literally, literally thought that there was a cross out there with their name on it. They were so frightened of the Jews. Peace be with you. If there was ever a group of people that needed to hear these words, it was these disciples in that upper room behind locked doors for fear of the Jews who all had said, Unequivocally, we are going to be loyal to you no matter what. We will even die with you. But when push came to shove, when Jesus was arrested, they headed for the hills. Peace be with you. If anyone needed to hear those words, as it was this group of disciples in that upper room behind locked doors for fear of the Jews, because now Jesus was standing before them, not a ghost. And boy, if he could defeat death, 
He could retaliate here if he should be so minded. Peace be with you. If anyone needed to hear these words, it was those disciples who had no idea what the mission was that they would be sent on. And finally, peace be with you. If anyone needs to hear those words, it's you and me. As we take a deep breath and are thankful that Lent is over with for another year and that Easter has come. But we know, we know in our hearts that Jesus, even though he died for our sins, those sins of the past keep coming up. They keep haunting us. And we have hard times sometimes thinking about the past and realizing what we have done. Yes, we know that sins are forgiven, but that guilt still feels there, doesn't it? It still presses against us. And we long for the comfort that only God can give. And God desires to give. Now, I mentioned before the service that this is kind of a unique portion of Scripture. And usually, when we hear this portion of Scripture... One thing rings, rings in, our, in our hearts and our minds as good Lutherans, and that is we see a, I hate to use the word proof passage, but it is a foundation passage, maybe that's better said, of one of the uh, six chief parts of, of uh, the Lutheran, of Christian doctrine, as Luther brings them out in his small catechism. You're familiar which one I'm talking about. It's the Office of the Keys, right? When we hear about where the, the power comes from and <coughs> And uh, Luther writes, thus writes uh, of the Holy Evangelist, John chapter 20, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. There we go. There is the office of the keys. And it's given to the church. And that is a powerful message to hear. That's a powerful message to share. But there are so many things in this text that really bring something, bring something special forth. And what I want to bring, bring out here is was brought out beautifully in the children's message too, by the way. It's when it says, the Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples. I'd like to take you back in scripture, back to uh, Genesis 1, right at the beginning. And you know what Genesis 1 brings forth. It's the creation of the world, and we believe that the world was created in six 24-hour days, and that God did it by the power of his might. And we know that Basically, not a whole lot of action was going on until the fifth day. Remember, it was on the fifth day that the birds came. God said, let there be birds, and bang, there were birds. God said, let there be fish, and there were fish. And then God said, let there be animals creeping around, cows and pigs and lions and tigers and all kinds of things. And then it was all by his word. But then God did something special, something that, we, if you, that we, we're going to give a little thought to here. God went down with his own hands, took the dust of the ground, and he said, let us make man in our own image, and that means a variety of things, but you can, you can just see God forming the head, you know, of Adam, and giving him the eyes that he had, and maybe giving him a mustache to begin with, but saying, nah, don't need a mustache, you know. Did the, did the arms and gave him great shoulders and uh, maybe not that big, you know. And he did everything. And he looked at him, and while he was creating him, not only the outside features, not only the outside features, because we do that with snowmen, you know, and maybe something at the, uh, on, the, on a beach, we create whatever, you know, a figure. But God was not only creating the outside, but the inside too. And there he was, there was man laying there. That's all he was doing, was laying there. Until what? God breathed in him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God didn't say, poof, there's Adam. He could have, but he didn't. He was very intimate with making man, creating him in just a certain special way, and then breathing into him. He didn't breathe into birds. He didn't breathe into lions. He breathed he, his breath came and entered into man. And man breath, had that breath, that wonderful breath of life. That wonderful breath of life. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before that breath became just a little bit stale to begin with. As he listened to Satan, as he listened to what the devil had to say, and then all of a sudden, while man was still alive, 
that breath, that air got a little bit uh, funky, would we say? You know, it just wasn't quite right. Only man, you know, it wasn't really bad at first, at least in man's perception. But as time went on, it got worse and worse and worse. And we think about the smog that some of the, the urban areas have, you know. And after a while, you're in those urban areas, and you don't, you don't seem to notice it because you've gotten so used to it, so accustomed to it. I would like to submit to you that we have become so accustomed in our society, in our world, to the smog that sin brings forth that we don't realize it a lot of times. We don't realize how far we have fallen from God. We don't realize that. And we kind of think to ourselves, I wish, I wish we could go back to the good old days. Well, those good old days were thousands of years ago because we haven't recognized the smog of sin in our lives even today. You know, one of the things I remember, I grew up in a farm in northwestern Iowa in an old house. We didn't have indoor plumbing, had the old outhouse. And, you know, houses back then, farmhouses, were not really built all that well because in the winter, Winter, well, we had sometimes frost on the inside of the windows and maybe even a little snow dab would have to put plastic up on the windows. And what I'm sharing with you is something that only those people who live with four seasons can really identify with. Maybe that's why California is so off-key, you know, in so many ways, because they, don't, they can't experience this. I can remember how it was. We've had to put the storm windows up and everything. We put straw around the outside of the house to kind of insulate it a little bit more. And the winter, I don't know. Sometimes the winters in Iowa seem to go on as long as the winters in Wisconsin seem to go on. But it seemed like it was forever. But then there came that one day, that one day when it seemed that bingo, spring had arrived. And all of a sudden, storm windows were off, windows were open, and you could feel that breath of fresh air coming in. And how wonderful it was. You, you, you kind of forgot what it smelled like, what fresh air was all about, because you didn't want to spend that much time outside. You, you were getting freezed up and everything else. Now the air was coming through. That's the way it is. That's the way it is when the Holy Spirit comes into us, when God breathes upon us. He, Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And we would like to say that we would like to have him breathe on us. And you know what? The good news is he does. Through his word and sacraments, through the means of grace, God continues to breathe in us to give us new life. And that's, that, that's apparent. That, that, that's noticed. It's readily noticed. As we leave church on Sunday morning, that we leave, leave with a skip on a, a, a in our step, you know, that we really kind of, yeah, I feel good. I feel good. Not because of what I have done, but because the Holy Spirit was there refreshing me, enlivening me, uh, re reassuring me that my sins are forgiven. Now, I know that this week I'm going to be doing some more sinning and Satan and this old stinking flesh of mine is going to remind me of past sins and that's going to start to bring me down. But I know I can go to God's word and there the Spirit there, Jesus is, is coming to me once again. The breath of life is coming. How much we need that breath of life. Remember in Ezekiel 37, the story of dry bones, the chapter of dry bones, where the, the, in the valley there are bones all over the place, and God says, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, oh, only you know if they can. And then he goes to work, and in his miraculous way, probably not as... Uh, uh, in such a, a close way as he did with Adam. But we get, we get tendons, we get muscles, we get skin and everything else, but still they're lying on the ground. Can these bones live? Oh Lord, only you know. And then what does he do? He breathes into them and a mighty army comes forth. That's the church, isn't it? That's you and me. God breathes in us by ourselves. We're content with that old stinking air. But God breathes in us and we have new life. And we, even if it's just for a little bit, just for a little bit, which kind of shows how we need the Spirit coming into our lives on a regular basis, on a continual basis, we feel alive once again. We feel alive because God has breathed into us. He has reassured us of forgiveness. I think it was about a year ago I was helping at a vacancy in Oneida. And for some reason or another, this thought came to mind and I was going to kind of look at farmhouses on the way to Oneida. 
to see if what I was looking for was, was, it was in existence anymore. You know, things pass and sometimes things fly by and, and uh, you don't know what happened to them. And some of you may not be familiar with this term. Some of you, I'm sure, are, but some of you may not. Many of you may not, I don't know. Anyhow, I was looking at farm places. And I was looking at this farm place and that one, taking my time. And I was almost to the point of thinking to myself that we don't see these things anymore. And then, to my surprise, two farmhouses in a row, not far from one another, they both had what I was looking for. What I was looking for, and you may have already guessed this, is a clothesline. Remember back in the days when you had a dryer, maybe for winter, but who would use a dryer in the summer when you could hang things out? Monday was always wash day, so that meant Monday night. Oh, Monday night was a glorious night because Monday night, when you crawled into bed, you got to smell those sheets, the fresh air that was there with them. How we enjoyed that. That's what we as Christians experience, not only on Mondays, but every day of our lives as the Holy Spirit, as God breathes into us. That is something we experience in our lives, and that's something that we can kind of show and reveal to others. They're not going to know for sure what's going on until we tell them, but they're going to see something different taking place in our lives. And we can, we can take that opportunity to share, yeah, yeah, I'm feeling good. <coughs> it's not because of anything I've done but because the Holy Spirit works in me. He's given me that breath of fresh air. He has given me that new life that only He can give, that comes through the cross of Christ. My sins are forgiven. And I'm not going to let the smog of sin in this world put me down or keep me down. And I'm not going to get used to what's taking place. And I'm not going to think that I'm going to be able to personally do anything about it because it's Jesus. It is Jesus continually, through and through, who comes in, who brings us to life. And as he looks at the world, he knows the smog of sin is down there. And he knows that the prince of this world is no longer the all-powerful as if he ever was. But through Jesus' death and resurrection, new life can come. And here and there, as you look down at the world, you see this new life in God's people. May we receive that breath of life that God, and only God, intended for us to have in the first place and continues to give to us, desires to give to us through his word. In this Easter season, in the name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.